Good morning. We're still in the book of James. And if you're not familiar with the book of James, James is Christianity with its sleeves rolled up. It's the working person's practical guide to living the Christian faith. James emphasizes faith put into action. It's not just a thought. If it's not lived out, it's worthless. Life without prayer is like a car without fuel. Life without prayer grinds to a halt, like a lamp without electricity. The prayer-starved Christian fails to shine in a dark world, a desperately dark world. And weak faith is faith. It's the faith of the size of a mustard seed. Alfred Tennyson, the first baron, he was the poet, poet laureate of much of the Victorian reign in England. And he writes, more things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. Wherefore, let their voice rise like a fountain for me night and day. For what are men better than sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain? If knowing God, they lift not hands of prayer, both for themselves and for those who call them friend. For so the whole round earth is every way bound by gold chains about the feet of God. Today we're looking at <clears throat> James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18, the power of prayer. See, earnest prayer is powerful. It's effective. And those who are sick or who are troubled especially should engage with God and th with the community in prayer. God brings healing through prayers of faith. Faith is submitting ourselves to God's plan even in the most difficult times of our lives. And confessing sins to one another in community brings healing. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth was blessed. This passage is built on the one previously that talked about waiting 
patiently for the future coming of the Lord, being patient and confident. This passage focuses on the availability of God to his people. He is available to us in prayer. Both of these sections, what we studied last week on patience and this week on prayer, that our submission to God and to his will is the important aspect of it. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. See, different people respond to difficulties and suffering in different ways. How do unbelievers, you know, typically respond? How do most mature Christians, you know, respond? How do you usually respond? See, if you don't have any source of strength outside yourself, an unbeliever just goes into a panic. They worry. They stress. Some Christians do that too, but not the mature ones. The mature ones put their faith and confidence in God. How do you respond? When was the last time you confessed to another person and had them pray with you and for you regarding sin? Why do many believers find this so difficult? Often to the point of not doing it at all. Well, that's easy. If you've ever confessed something to someone who never confesses anything themselves, they just are collecting dirt. It's a matter of judgment and gossip and feeling superior. You don't confess to those kind of people. And if you've ever had the horror of doing it, you realize that was a mistake. You have to confess your sins with people who you trust. And you don't trust people by backing up and dumping everything in your life before them. You trust them with small things. And then when you can trust them with bigger things, that's what a friendship and a relationship is all about. It's a growing walk of trust and confidence. We call that friendship. And he talks about singing songs of praise. This passage of in the Greek is used also in Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 14, 15 and Ephesians 5, 19. So this is a recurring theme in the New Testament. It's a response of our hearts. It should be a prayerful thing lifting our hearts in worship, thanksgiving, honoring to God for who he is and what he has done. It's not just a song about something that is not reflective of an inner reality. The right response is always to turn to God in prayer and praise. Why do we sing in church? You know, it's, um, is it to create a mood? Is it allow people to stand, to stretch, to provide a break between different parts of the service? But see, a hymn should be a form of prayer. It should be sung with devotion. It 
What are the songs that you find yourself singing when alone? when you're praising God in your own heart and mind. If you're not doing that, why aren't you? Some of the darkest days in my life were blessed with light by singing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Sick is, we think of physical illness. We think of germs, bacteria, a virus. But James was in a world that sickness can be mental, physical, emotional, spiritual. It can be a result of satanic power. Struggles like depression, overwhelming struggles with anger, hearing evil voices in your head. All of the things that trouble us. And the passage says to anoint them with oil. In the ancient world, oil meant a lot of things. Oil was medicinal. We see this in a passage. We see it associated with joy in Psalms 45, verse 7, and Isaiah 61. It's a symbol for healing. It's an anointing, symbolizing power in the presence of the Holy Spirit in 1 Samuel 16, 13. It's associated with joy. It's associated with being part of a belonging to the Lord. The person who is anointed with oil belongs to God, meaning that God is responsible for taking care of them. Jesus told a parable of the Good Samaritan. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And the priest and the Levite, they passed by. But the Samaritan, the one you would least expect to show compassion because of cultural expectations, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. And he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he took care of him. See, in the ancient world, things like honey, oil, wine, vinegar, were the medicinal elements that, that saved lives. We see this in ancient Egypt. This is recorded in the Ebers papyrus, the using things like lint, animal grease, honey, oil, is a means of healing. And it says, let them call the elders of the church. Most of these churches were small, home churches. The elders had a pastoral oversight over the people. They were a good shepherd. They were guardians of the flock. They cared about the individuals within the congregation. This is something we don't see much of in the modern church. They had spiritual authority and they were known for their piety. People respected them. And they prayed in the name of the Lord. A prayer offered in faith 
will make a sick person well. Verse 15. The concept of praying in faith is the idea of submitting to God and to his will. To offer a prayer in faith is to approach God with the attitude that God knows whether or not healing is best for us. And the New Testament healing is often linked with faith. The stronger the faith, the better. And it's quite a statement that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well and the Lord will raise him up. Mark eleven twenty four states that whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. See, prayer has incredible power, but God alone decides when and how. This declaring and daring to tell God what to do with that is in some of the theological teachings about healing in our modern world is contrary to this passage. It's in the name of the Lord. See, prayer is powerful, but it doesn't always turn out as we pray. Charles Spurgeon tells this interesting story on the power of prayer. He, he writes, I have reminded you before of the father who had prayed for many years for his sons and daughters, and yet they were not converted, but all became exceedingly worldly. His time came to die. He gathered his children about his bed, hoping to bear such a witness for Christ at the last, that it might be blessed to have their conversion. But unhappily for him, he was in deep distress of the soul. He had doubts about his own interest in Christ. He was one of God's children who were put to bed in the dark, this being, above all, the worst fear of his mind that he feared his dear children would see his distress and be prejudiced against religion. The good man was buried, and his sons came to the funeral. And God heard the man's prayer that day. For as they went away from the grave, one of them said to the other, Brother, our father died a most unhappy death. He did, brother. I was very much astonished at it, for I never knew a better man than our father. I, said the first brother, if a holy man such as our father found it a hard thing to die, it will be dreadful for us who have had no faith when our time comes. That same thought had struck them all and drove them to the cross. And so the good man's prayer was heard in a mysterious way. See, the outcome of our prayer may not be as we expect, but God always answers our prayers. He is sovereign. There was a, a woman pastor named Catherine Kuhlman. And uh, she was known for praying for people and they were healed. And she made it very clear on Johnny Carson one night. I can pray, but it's God decides. I don't decide. God 
decides what he wants to do. He always is sovereign. If they have sinned, James goes on, they will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that so you may be healed. Why confess sin? See, some have thought you have to do this in order to be saved, but Christ has made it possible to go, for us to go directly to God. We don't have to talk to a priest. We don't have to talk to someone else to be forgiven. But confessing ourselves to one another has an important place in the life of the church. If we've sinned against an individual, we must ask that person to forgive us. If our sin has affected the church, we must confess it publicly. If we need loving support as we struggle with a sin, we should confess the sin to those who are able to provide that support. In my life, I've had many people who've had drug or other addictive habits that they struggle with. And they need to talk about it. They need to confess it. See, there was a time where you couldn't talk about these things without being rejected. That's why things like Celebrate Recovery are so important in the church. AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, Anonymous was developed by a Lutheran pastor. See, if conf after confessing a private sin to God, we still don't feel the forgiveness we may need, we can continue to assure the one who has fallen that God has forgiven them. See, a lot of people base everything on their feelings. You may not feel forgiven for a long time, but the reality is God forgives. And then he turns to Elijah Elijah was a human being, even as we are. See, sometimes we put these individuals from the Old Testament on pedestals and think that they are so beyond us. But if we get into the nitty gritty of who they were and what they struggled with, read Genesis. These are all broken families broken relationships, it's only by the grace of God that any of them could be used. Of course, God answered Elijah's prayers, you'd say. Elijah was a superstar, an important prophet, but I am a nobody. See, if we go to God and ask in prayer, just as Elijah did, our prayers can be answered if we are praying according to the will of God. Elijah knew God's will. He was in a spiritual battle. He prayed earnestly. It's, it's interesting that James turns to Elijah and the story about rain has nothing to do with healing, but it has to do with answering prayer. We can accomplish what God wants us to accomplish through prayer. And if we don't get our desired outcome, the process of of dialoguing and interacting with God affects our hearts. It's more than just praying for healing. God's arm is not too short and there is nothing beyond the power of God. 
which is available to us if we pray earnestly. See, James envisions healing taking place in the local church. And he gives parameters for it. But we know that not all healing will take place in this life. Much of the hope is in the future. Where God will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old order of things have passed away. Revelations 21, verse 4. See, God's word is not something just for us to read and think about. It's not an intellectual activity. When we study the word, we have to respond. He wants us to do something. See, James was a well-known man. He was the brother of Jesus, and he had a nickname. Anybody know what that nickname? It was Camel Knees, because he spent so much time on his knees in prayers that they were calloused like a camel's. But if any of you lacks wisdom, he says in 1.5 of the book of James, let him ask God, who gives it to us all generously without approach, and it will be given to him. See, when I was sick, I woke up in the middle of the night. I took an antibiotic that I had never taken. I had a reaction to it. I couldn't breathe. My, my voice, my esophagus was swollen. My mouth was swollen. My tongue inside my mouth was swollen. I prayed, and I called 911. The next day I called family and friends. Why don't we call the church when we're sick these days? And yeah, think about it. See, sometimes today pastors are the last one to know when somebody is sick, hospitalized, or incapacitated. And if it's a mental illness or some kind of depression, they, they'll go into hiding. You have no idea. Why is it that they seldom go to the church anymore? It's because there's such a gulf between the leadership of the church and the people. They don't know each other. I was on the elder board for a new pastor. And after two or three years of being at the church, I would stand at the door with him and tell him who the people were. See, he was aloof. He saw himself as a speaker. He didn't have the heart of a pastor. He didn't know them. That is the reason why people don't call the church. Prayer doesn't always result in healing. Paul tells us that three times he asked God for this thorn to be removed from his flesh, and he got a direct, unequivocal no from God. 
2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 9. He was well content with the weaknesses that he had. See, some of the brokenness in our lives makes us more understanding of others. It proves that we are we need God to be sufficient. Physical healing is not promised to anybody. I'm not suggesting that God can't heal. He absolutely does. God can and does heal people, sometimes instantly, sometimes miraculously, sometimes slowly, sometimes gradually. And we don't even talk about the healing that is part of James's thinking. It's not just physical illness. There are mental illnesses that can be healed. The Bible tells us 12 specific things for which the believers are instructed to pray. We pray to pray for, for those who persecute them. We should be praying for the FBI and the DOJ. And for the Christian who are in pagan lands who are being oppressed by the governments. We should be praying for the kingdom of God. We're to be praying for the daily provision, thy daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread for overcoming temptations, for forgiveness. There are people who probably still are struggling with to forgive. You need to be praying about that for all the saints, all the saints, not just the ones you feel a kinship with. For the gospel's advancement, we need to be praying for earthly rulers, individuals that are brought to our attention by the media, for wisdom, for perseverance, through suffering for one another and praying for the wayward believer. I had a friend who was in my wedding <clears throat> and um, he was very close to the Lord when we first met. And when he went off to college, things changed. And he's gotten further and further away from the Lord. He had kids. One of his kids wanted to go to church and take him. And he went, but it had, didn't have an effect on his heart. I keep praying. And I will keep praying. And just because someone becomes a Christian that God has put on our hearts, we need to continue to pray for them. The first young man that I worked with in probation in 1977 became a Christian. He got married. He had a daughter. Three years ago, his wife died of cancer and he's struggling, and I keep praying. It's, it's hard to pray consistently. I pray for people when they come to my mind. See, prayer is the solution for every problem. And one way that would help us is to remind ourselves of a nearly forgotten hymn by Hugh Stowell. 
From every stormy wind that blows, from every swelling tide of woes, there is calm, a sure retreat, tis found beneath the mercy seat. Ah, whither could we flee for aid when tempted, desolate, dismayed? Or how the hosts of hell defeat had suffering saints no mercy seat? Prayer can accompany the application of medicine, of oil. Prayer doesn't exclude intelligent action. It includes it. Praying in the name of the Lord meant praying according to God's will. God's arm is not too short, and there is nothing beyond the power of God which is available to the one who prays earnestly. Don't forget, God is listening. Are you praying? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you Teach us to talk to you. Teach us to bring others to you and their physical, emotional, mental needs. Teach us to pray. Speak to our hearts. May we serve you. May we sing your praises joyfully because we want your will to be accomplished in our lives, in our world, and especially in the lives of those we love. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.